Hello again, bit of an update on where we're at. Um, we're still working on the heater for the car, um, still working on the fuel pipes, can do a bit more on that today. And also I'm going to replace the rear shock absorbers. So we'll get into that in a minute. This is where we're at with the rear heater tray, the one that goes under the rear seat. You can ignore that, that's a, a, an old house light that I'm reconditioning. The, um, I've had this in, in um, rust remover um, and it's worked pretty well. I mean, I've actually um, used a flap wheel on this, this one. Um, you can maybe see how pitted some of the rust is and this is actually the better one, uh, the better lid, but um, it's pretty pitted. The other thing is the, the rust remover um, won't get under the paint in some areas it's pretty effective paint that was used on these originally black paint as you can see i've got paint stripper i'm trying to get some of it off but it's resisting the paint stripper pretty well and also where the where there's rust bubbled under the paint the rust remover can't get to that so i've had this i haven't had this in rust remover yet i've had the lid uh, in rust remover and um, there's still a few areas I want to re-dip it and leave it uh, a bit. So haven't made as much progress on this as I planned. I've also, the the front ones have been in rust remover, but they're so intricate inside. There, there are, um, uh, you know, it's not just a box. There are, there are panels inside and baffles and all sorts that make it really difficult to get uh, rust remover in or, or at least to, to be able to scrape them in some way. So I'm dipping them um i'm gonna I'm, I'm i'm taking as much paint off as i can as well but there are just some areas inside that i can't get to so uh, i looked into having them chemically dipped can't find a company around here that does chemical dipping so i'm just going to do as best as i can using rust remover dipping them in that and um uh, you know using flat wheels and wire brushes and whatever internally then i'll probably uh use a, a rust converter on the uh, on them because I can't get into all of the seams um, and that's just going to have to be as good as uh, good as it can be it's going to be a lot better than it was as you see this is the um, this is the tray that I got from David Green it's actually pretty good if you look inside it's a lot lot better than the one that I had um, but it does need re-spraying so I'm, I'm doing that um, David actually sent I'll just go out here um, I actually got the whole unit, so I've got another motor which is in amazingly good condition. Um, for for you know that's that's obviously been inside the car, um, but the the motor casing there is in incredible condition. Um, so I've got a spare motor, I've got a spare matrix. Um, it's got. A fair amount of calcium inside. I don't know if you can see that um, or scale. So probably once cleaning, but I'll keep that as a spare. And um, this is the old tray that, as you can see, is full of holes. So this is the one I'm not going to use. That can be thrown away. So not quite as much progress on this as I would have liked. I'd hope to get this painted this week, but haven't been able to. Um, I've actually been doing a bit of gardening, <laughs> which is a bit of a change. So, um, yeah, not quite as much as prog progress as I'd like on the heaters, but I do want to, you know, I don't have to do this again, so I may as well do it as best as I can um, and uh, get as much rust off as possible. So I'm also going to fit replacement shock absorbers. These are rear shock absorbers. I actually bought these a few years ago from Wadhams and I just haven't got around to fitting them. These are the rears. I fitted the fronts, but I haven't fitted the rears, so I'm going to do that today. Um, obviously, these are these are new Spax gas uh, adjustable shock absorbers. Not that that really matters too much on a car like this, but um, they're, they're new and shiny and uh, should last a lot longer than the originals. So, so you may just be able to see 
the original shock absorber there if I can get the light in a bit better um, this is the shock absorber here the the lower mounting is a bolt that goes through this is the lower mounting here let's try and get some better light there you go um, so it's a bolt that goes through uh, the axle and um, quite a long bolt and then the, the damper goes on the end that's the lower and as you can see this one isn't leaking but it's pretty old and crusty so I'm going to replace it the other one I think is leaking um, obviously they need to be done in pairs you can't just do one side so that's the lower mount now if we go inside the car the rear of the car um, this is why I thought I'd do this now while I've got the um, if you've seen the previous video this is where the the heater tray goes for the rear heater that's where the motor pokes through um, and then behind the rear seat there is uh, an access panel just a, a steel plate it looks very homemade but um, that's the way Rover did it and that opens up the top mounting point for the damper the the, the oil damper so um, I've just soaked that in rust in, in penetrating oil it looks in pretty good condition it's quite high up uh, in a you know that's actually inside the boot so um, it, it's not exposed to the the weather so it's in pretty good condition the top mount but um, we'll get that nut off and um, undo the lower one and try and get the damper out of the car on this side I, I won't do the other side until I turn the car around um, so I'm going to do the other side doors and I'll do the other side damper because there's more space this side of the garage so that's the top mount um, the bottom mount should come off fairly easily as well because I had that off quite some time ago and I refurb the uh, leaf springs a few years ago and I put um, rust uh, sorry, uh, copper slip on the the bolt so that should come off as well uh, pretty easily but um, I'll try that now there you go there's the bolt that goes through the lower damper uh, you can see it's heavily covered in copper slip which has done its job although it's only been a few years um, so that goes through probably can't see very well uh, but that goes through this lower mount and then the damper should basically just slide off uh, the bushing there so um, I'm just gonna try and get this off the lower mount and then it should lift out so just before we put it in if we look at the top of the new damper so this one's got uh, two lock nuts rather than a one nylock nut I would think originally it wouldn't have had nylock nuts on it I don't think they were kind of period correct so I, I think the um, if we look at the actually the old damper here um, is in is not in bad condition up in the, the tunnel um, and it's got made in England on it if you can just see that at the top but the, I can't see any brand name there's a part number the originals would have been woodhead shock absorbers um, which I think were, I think they were like a light blue colour. Uh, so I don't think this is original. I think that's been replaced at some point. Um, but if we if we look at the new one, it's got this locking two locking nuts. I've just got one on there, and then uh, the mounts and the so the the bodywork is sandwiched there where my fingers are between the two mounts. So I'm just going to push the, this up into the tower and uh, roughly try and get it in position then start uh, putting it back together it's a very quick thing job to do though okay so i've just put some uh, some grease on that lower mount and now i'm just going to put the bolt through um you probably can't see let me just move the light so there's the bolt coming through that side so uh, the lower shot mount needs to compress quite a lot um, to tighten the bolt up but I shall get that back in now. Okay, so you can just about get just compress that lower shock mount enough to uh, to get the thread started, and then uh, no, you can't.
try that again. See if we can just get it. Yeah, there you go. That's, that's tightening up. So that's going to compress the rear, the lower mount um, between this washer on the nut and the, the actual mount itself. So I shall just tighten this up. any of this because there's a tube welded between these uh, these kind of mounting blades so you can't crush it you just tighten it up and yeah that's evenly spaced on the lower mount so that should be good then if we go inside the car we should see the top mount poking through okay so there you go I've just tightened the two lock nuts up against each other and compressed the bushing uh, the top bushing that's centered on the hole um, put some copper slip on there not that this as I say this is inside the boot so it shouldn't really rust anyway but um, doesn't hurt so that is one shock absorber done. Um, if we have a quick look under the car, just get some light. So, as you can see, uh, just about, just see the shock, the low, the bottom of the shock absorber. I mounted the um, the adjuster to the rear. Uh, I just thought probably better to keep it out of muck that's coming under the car. So the adjuster is the, the the knob on the rear. Obviously, I'm not going to really mess with that. I, I set it to the middle setting. I think there were 36 set um, clicks. So I've set it to um, 18. Um, I'll do the same on the other side. I think I did that on the front. Obviously, if that's not right, I'll I'll you know I'll see what the ride's like. But I would imagine that's going to be okay. So that's um, one shock absorber done. Uh, looks like I've painted them to match the car bodywork but I haven't that's the colour they come so um, it's another little job done I'll do the other side when I turn the car around and do that side so uh, I think now I'm going to get on with some fuel pipe work I just wanted to have a quick look at the fuel tap that uh, came off the car this is the reserve tap so two of the pipes come from the fuel tank and then one goes off to the engine and you can switch between the two inlets it's same tank that the two pipes come from it's just one is lower down in the uh, tank that the pickup point is lower down in the tank so it allows you to draw the last bit of fuel out of the tank um, this was the one that was on the car um, it's not leaking as far as I have seen um, I just thought it'd be interesting to have a look at how this works this was if I just take these off this is a new old stock one that I bought on eBay um, take that off that's just the nut that's the original nut that holds it onto a bracket there this is the new old stock one uh, came in um, packaging original packaging sealed it's um, if you look on the you may be able to see that it says EW I don't know the manufacturer but um, I'm guessing that's the the manufacturer's mark and interestingly this is the original one that came off the car and you may just be able to see that's got EW on it as well um, it's identical for, uh, in every way. The only difference between the two is the uh, actuator arm. 
Um, uh, it, it, this one sits, so that's fully that way, so it's sitting at 45 degree uh, different angle. Um, it moves through that arc versus that arc. That's the only difference. I don't think it matters on the car. Whether this is intended for the Rover P5 or another, uh, you know, it was originally made for another make, I don't know. Um, I'm going to fit the new one anyway because it's, I have it, I may as well. I mean, it wasn't expensive on eBay. And I tend to, as, as things come up, new old stock pieces come up on eBay, I just tend to buy them unless they're crazy expensive. Uh, it's just, you know, I, I much prefer if I can to use new old stock or original items um, in very good condition rather than remanufactured because sometimes remanufactured parts um, can be poor quality. Um, although I've, I've not really had that experience um, buying stuff from kind of Rover, Rover P5 specialists. Um, but I know there's there's a lot of discussion about things like suspension bushes and how long they last. Some things you just can't get, you know, they're, they're so rare now. Um, you, you just New old stock never comes up. So um, when things do, I just tend to buy them if I can afford it. So um, I'm going to use the new one. I just thought it would be interesting to have a look how this actually works because I've seen that you can buy new O-rings. I see there's a, a screw on the side which is the only opening. Ah, okay. Okay, so that's the O-ring seal for the barrel and then the barrel has just three ports in it that it switches between so uh, so that that screw just limits the travel it's it rides in that slot the end of that screw rides in that slot to limit the travel and as I say you can get new o-rings obviously you could just maybe replace it with a normal o-ring although Again, the quality of some O-rings you can get aren't very good, so you want this obviously to be uh, fuel-proof. Um, so it's a very simple item, and that just, yeah, that screw just limits the, the travel through an arc. So you... That's a little bit loose in, in that bore. There's a bit of movement there. Um, so let's just have a look at the, the new one. Or the new old stock one. Yeah, there's no, no movement in that. It feels a much... I know there's grease on it, but it feels that a much yeah you can hear that that's just sealing much nicer so irrespective of the o-ring i think uh, i'm going to use this new old stock one um, because it's new old stock i mean it, all the threads are identical um, if you if you look uh, exactly the same thread types, the body of it is identical. The only difference is this actuator arm. Uh, let's put the screw back in that. So I think this is the one I'm going to use. on the car so yeah that that one travels through so it's basically just this, this arm has been kind of staked on in a different position so we'll see how it goes i, I want to use that one because it feels even with, without the o-ring it feels a much nicer fit than uh, this one which is a bit wobbly 
So one of the things I want to do with my car while I'm still fiddling around with the heaters is to sort out the choke. So um, my car has a manual choke. You pull the, the choke lever out and uh, that opens the choke or closes the choke. Um, and then you push it in when the engine is running uh, warm enough. Um, later P5Bs had an automatic choke called an AED, uh, automatic enrichment device, which was somewhat problematic and you may well find that um, even later P5Bs have manual choke because they've been converted back. But as I say, my, my car I believe had the manual choke from uh, the start. Um, however, typical Rover fashion, they don't do things in the normal way. So um, if you think about uh, a normal choke, it's a very simple circuit. You've got 12 volts, uh, you've got a bulb you've got normally a switch on the cable and then you've got ground so when you pull the choke out that closes the switch and the warning light comes on to tell you the switch is is uh, to tell you the choke is on or out the p5b does things differently um, as I say, kind of typical Rover, why take the easy approach? So um, you've got the same warning light. You've got the same switch on the cable. But then you've also got another switch. And that goes down to ground. <clears throat> so this is the switch on the cable which is actually one of these on a P5B made by a company called Brycrest. Um, these are, I think, fairly widely used on, on British cars of the period. Um, you can see it's got a little, it's got a simple in out. It's got a little pip there that can move in and out. And when it's pushed in, it breaks the contacts. So this just clips on the choke cable. You can see there's a hole there that um, when the choke is closed, that is going to break the circuit so the light goes out. It's going to push on that pip. When you pull open the choke, the pip falls into that hole and uh, that closes the contacts and the light comes on. So when the choke's out, the light's on. It's warning you that the choke is on. So that's, that's the cable. That's in place on my car. This other switch is what's called an otter switch an otter is actually the the company that manufacture these um, this is a, a new old stock one that i got off ebay i don't know whether you can see on the, uh, the the black plastic it says otter and it says buxton england and then a patent number and v60 i think v60 is the part number uh, this also has July 70 stamped on it, which you may or may not be able to see just up here. Um, and then it's got some other number on there, B37C, I think. No idea what that is. Um, but this is this is the Otter switch, which is this additional switch. And this changes the function of the light. So what happens with this is you pull the cable, pull the choke out, and that switch closes, same as normal choke however the choke light won't come on because the otter switch is still open this only closes when the engine reaches a certain temperature which should be the temperature at which you don't need the choke anymore so on the p5b the choke light comes on when you can switch the choke off when it's time to switch the choke off now obviously that's somewhat inexact um you know it varies by the how the carbs are set up and all sorts of things but you know you can treat the on a p5b set up in this way you treat the choke light almost as the reminder to switch the choke off uh, push the choke in uh, as i say it's called not a switch so this is a new old stock one um, this fits in the top of the block of the v8 uh, three bolts as you can see on my car there's just a blanking plate because what tends to happen with these is because this part of the, the, the otter switch is sitting in the coolant, these can rust over time. So um, 
and that's quite common i think that these that these end up rusting and and not working so people remove them just put a blanking plate over um and basically just cable cable it out um you know if you if you leave, if you just jump that what was there uh, then this is just going to perform as a as a normal choke uh, when you know pull the choke out and the light comes on however um you know, I, I kind of find things like this partly what makes old cars interesting. So I want to make mine, take mine back to how it should be uh, with the otter switch. So I'm going to fit this in the top of the block. Um, all I basically need to do on my car, actually, what's what uh, what there is, is that there's none of this. This is just earthed there. So uh, basically, I just need to remove get rid of that earth cable, run a cable from this switch to the otter switch terminal there. And then obviously the body of the otter switch is grounded um, to the engine. So it's just one cable. It's um, a white yellow cable. Uh, so I've got some white yellow cable. Um, I'm going to run that in the engine bay to there and to there and that should work. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to test it quite yet because I've still got the heater in pieces. So there's no coolant uh, in the engine block. So I can't start the engine, check how this works. But um, unless this is faulty, which I mean, it's brand new, obviously it's an old brand new, but it, it should work. Um, then I'll just test it when uh, when I start the engine um i can you know i can check that it doesn't come on when, with the ignition on but i can't check that it it closes when the, t the engine temperature uh, reaches a certain point so that's what we're going to do we're going to run this cable white yellow cable uh, from the choke switch uh, or the choke cable under the dash to the otter switch uh, and then that should work so let's have a look where the otter switch fits um, if you can see this plate here these three bolts and this plate this is where the otter switch fits it's um, it's in the manifold um, the inlet manifold Let's try and, move it a little bit more. Uh, and um, it's basically in one of the water pa passages uh, I was a bit worried in case these bolts were were um, seized but actually they've they've un, started to lose them quite easily um, so i'm going to finish getting those bolts out and then pull the, the blanking plate off um, there is still some water in the block but not a lot so uh, because i've got the heater out so we'll get that off and put the otter switch in then uh, i'm going to run the cable um, inside as well So those came out pretty easily. Very small bolts uh, with a, a, a UNC thread, I, th I think. Most of the threads that go into the aluminium block are coarse, UNC. Fine thread tends to be in uh, um, harder metals. So uh, let's try and pry that off. stuck on oh no, there you go okay I don't know if that blanking plate is a proper part it looks a little bit homemade but it, I don't know no idea um, looks like there's some sort of sealant on the On there, but that's not in bad condition. And yeah, there's 
yeah, the, it's below the. This is actually at the very, pretty much at the highest point, apart from the heater, when the heater's in. Um, but without the heater in, this is the pretty much the highest point of the coolant cooling system. Um, pretty much anyway. So, okay, so I'm just going to clean that up a bit more, and then uh, we can mount the otter switch in there, which should just drop in. Yeah, that's quite a snug fit, but that's going to go in. Um, so I'm just going to clean that up and then we'll drop that in. And then um, I've started to run. So when I when I rewired the car, I didn't, still, well, a bit annoyingly, uh, I didn't run a cable for, or a wire for the uh, otter switch. So um, I've got some white yellow cable. Uh, I've just run it in some sheathing, just single cable. And it's coming up here and going through the grommet basically following the path of the main loom down this side and then across and in. I don't know what the original routing was, but that's what I'm going to go with. There's cables, there's a, the loom comes here to the alternator, so I'm just going to carry that on. You can see there actually the, um, the coolant temperature uh, transmitter wire, so I'm just going to basically follow that and come to the otter switch, which is the neatest routing. So, all right, I'm going to just Stop talking, clean that up, and then we'll get the otter switch in. Right, well that took a lot longer than I thought it would. Um, the, uh, the, the hole was quite tight to get the otter switch in, and the reason was there was a lot of, I don't know if it was calcium or from, from hard water, or just general corrosion, but the hole was really tight. And um, it was pushing the holes, the, the, the bolt holes slightly off center. So I had to clean out, um, basically scrape the hole to get rid of the calcium and then it fitted in, the, the otter switch fitted in much uh, more smoothly um, and there was a bit of movement to the side to get the bolts lined up. Anyway, so um, that's bolted down. Um, I've run the cable uh, through here. So the, the one, I've just put some sleeving over the two, uh, the one of the cables that was going to the temperature sensor already and then this is coming over to the otter switch and that's going um, along the inner wing following the current the existing loom uh, through the grommet down in behind the dashboard so um, next thing I just need to route that under the dashboard to the choke switch and terminate that and um, we should be good to go then I think so um, that's all I'm going to do on that for now. I'll do the inside maybe tomorrow. Um, I'm going to get on with something else.